It's good to see everyone out there today. At my age, it's good to see anybody. It's good to be in the house of the Lord this morning. Amen? Amen. The Bible verse is 1 John 5.13. These things I have written to who believe in the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life and that you may continue to believe in the name of the Son of God. Today, I ask the question, who is your Jesus? Who is your Jesus? Qualified leadership is needed on any journey of life. To help make good judgments concerning all matters. We may claim Jesus as our guide, our leader, our savior. But to each and every one of us, he might seem different. Are we along with the rest of the Christian world, turning Jesus into a Jesus of our own making? Has he become an inconvenient truth? The guy you're afraid to refer to, perhaps. Right here, right now, Jesus is with us. He is Emmanuel, God with us. Let us pause for prayer. Dear Lord, Heavenly Father, we humbly come before you this morning. Heavenly Father, as we open the book your Bible, the bread of life, Heavenly Father, lift us up. Give us comprehension, Heavenly Father. May the words I speak be your words and not my own. Lord, bring us together in unity to study your word. In your holy name, the Son, Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Knowingly and unknowingly, we follow constructs. These constructs have been presented to the world throughout our past and present Christian historical journey. We have what is known as the Catholic construct, the Methodist construct, the Episcopal construct, the Church of God construct, the Baptist construct. And in my life, I do with a lot of Amish. They have their own construct. I do with a lot of Mennonites. They have their own construct. And it's interesting. And I could go on and on about the many varied constructs. And they all behold to their individual beliefs and their own individual individual doctrines. Instead of being transformed by beholding Jesus, Christians have put him into a place, painted him into a picture in a room, a figment of their own design and imagination, perhaps. They could say to you, this is my Jesus, and if you don't like how he looks this way, and if you don't think my way, well, you are wrong, and you can't have him your way. And that's all I have to say about the matter. There's leaving no room for discussion. There's no civil debate. But 2 Timothy 3.16-17 to states, All scripture is given by inspiration of God, not by man, and it is profitable, profitable for doctrine. And it is not just a prophet to simply fill church pews, but it is for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. And you may ask, why do this? Why do it this way? Because in 17 it says, in verse 17 it states that the man of God may be made perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. You must understand that you can't do it on your own, friends. 
You must allow the Holy Spirit to inspire you. And the only way that can happen is by and through what? The word of God, the simple truth. And we can only become perfect, as it states, referring to 1 Timothy 3.17, by and through the sacrifice that Jesus made for us. Am I getting feedback? Is that, what, is that what's happening? Uh, I think I do. Yeah. We need to minister using our testimonies as God's calling. 2 Timothy 4 has further teaching on this. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 1 through 6. I charge thee, therefore, before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearance in his kingdom. Preach the word. Be instant in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lusts shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. And they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned into fables. But watch thou in all things, endure all afflictions, do the work of an evangelist, make full proof of thy ministry. For I am now ready to be offered, and the time of my departure is at hand. E.G. White states, There is always a burning desire to spin something fantastic in order to mesmerize souls over to Jesus. No one is to put the divine word to torture by cheap imaginations. The forced mystical construct upon the word of God is a sin of the highest order, turning truth into lies. Jesus would not have our minds dwell on such unprofitable ideas. We see before us and around us throughout the world, there's a fabrication of lies going on. We must be very careful, friends, to sort through the quagmire of such implications. Only through the simple word of God can we find where we need to be sitting within all that is going on. These are strange times, are they not? These are times I don't think that any of us have ever expected to see. It's incredible. The process of testimony requires not a certain skin tone, nor a hairstyle, nor stylish dress. You simply humbly meet Jesus just the way you are and take his message forward. And that is what we have, friends, that is so powerful each to each individual is our own personal testimonies because no one can refute that. Everywhere you go, you carry your temple with you. 1 Corinthians 3.16 Know ye not that you are the temple of God, and that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you. Each of us, as I stated, each of us, we are a testimony to God. We are each a miracle of creation. We are beautifully and wonderfully made. By choice, we are his. By his choice, he knew us before we were even born. And you want to talk about hard choices. How about the cross? That must have been an incredibly hard choice for Jesus to make. He made that choice for all the world. Now it is up to you to do what? We must be obnoxiously, obnoxiously persistent. We must keep knocking on the Lord's door with prayer until you get his blessing, until we each get his blessing. 
We must continually be knocking on the door. And how do we do that? Through reading, through study. We must be like Jacob, and we must claim it as ours. Because this book is full of his promises, and we have to claim it. If we don't claim it, if we don't study, we don't say, Lord, you said this, you promised. How are you going to get blessings? Even back in the days of Jesus, the definition inconvenient truth existed and could be used. As the long-awaited Messiah, Jesus was not recognized, not even in his hometown. They ask, who is this guy? We know his parents. Can any good have come out of Nazareth? Jews had the daily public reading of the Old Testament, and they adhered to it. They were identified by the laws of Moses and stood at the very crossroads of biblical prophecy. Where are we standing today? Could we not be standing in the same place? Look around. Yes, we too are at a historical, or could we say hysterical, crossroads. Jewish priests did not know the Savior who was standing right in front of them. Do you know the Savior? That's a yes or no question. Do you know the Savior? I pray that it is a resounding yes. He is right here, as I keep stating. Jesus is right here in this book. John chapter 5, 46 to 47. Jesus is speaking. For had ye believed Moses, and he was talking to the Jews' hierarchy, had you believed in Moses, these first few books, they were supposed to be reading them, weren't weren't they? On a daily basis. Ye would have believed me, Jesus. For Moses wrote of me, In here it is written. But if ye believe not his writings, how shall ye believe my words? How shall ye believe my words? Jesus put them on the spot. Are we on the spot today? We had better be standing on the rock of Jesus. That is the only spot to be in these perilous times. These priests would have said, No, he ain't our Christ. He doesn't fit our expectations. He will not reshape our thinking as to what our Messiah should be. We are, wa- we are waiting on a mighty display from God to appoint an agent as promised, a true anointed one. That's what we're looking for. The Jewish nation, spiritually and emotionally, they were fragmented. They were divided constructs. As deliverers, of the Holy Word to the world, and as God's chosen, they were failing in bringing the message to the world on God's behalf because they were so divided in their expectations, in their deliveries of the message. They weren't unified. Number one, The Sadducees and the Herodians aligned themselves with the local government and were content in the delicate balance that they had. Everything for them was business as usual. 
And that's where they were. They were seated in the act of business as usual. The Pharisees were looking for that political Messiah who would deliver them from the oppression of pagan Rome. Jewish zealots wanted a military leader so that they could crush and overthrow Roman domination. And the Essenes, they were fed up with politics and religious corruption, and they got out of town and into the mountains where they could work out their own salvation in peace, looking for the teacher of righteousness. The Essenes needed confirmation that they were holy enough and righteous enough. Does that sound familiar? Every part of this Jewish fragmented construct cited their favorite texts to prove positive their ideas their own views of the Messiah, and the end-time prophecies. However, Jesus, who we will call the inconvenient truth, rejected them all. He encouraged all his believers to pull together the Old Testament as a whole, not just favorite passages, but the books in their entirety. And much to the dismay of the Jews, but a blessing to us. Jesus including, included the whole world in, as his ministry. Amen to that. And as we said before, Jesus chose us. And here's the scripture to back it up. John 5.16 Ye have not chosen me, but I have chosen you and ordained you that ye should go and bring forth fruit and your fruit should remain that whatsoever you shall ask of the Father in my name, he may give to you. Here's a key point. When when we are gathered together and we pray, even alone in our war closets, we ask God our Father, we must always include the name of Jesus. And the point being, remember, Jesus is the sacrifice. His blood anoints our prayers. Heavenly Father, in Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. Always include the sacrifice. Always include the blood of Jesus to anoint your prayer. Matthew 28, 18 to 20. And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever that I have commanded you, How many commandments does that include? How many? All of them. Not just nine, not just eight, but all of them. All of them. And what else should we add? Love thy neighbor as who? A lot of that going on today, isn't there? And to, and, and lo, excuse me, lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the world. Amen. And Jesus stated, if you love me, keep my commandments. Jesus, at this point, He was kicking the hornet's nest. Christ challenged the permanent physical Jewish construct, which was their temple. Number one, he claimed authority over the premises by cleansing that temple, 
Matthew 21, 12 to 13, And Jesus went up to the temple of God and cast out all them that sold and bought in the temple and overthrew the tables of the money changers and the seats of them that sold doves and said unto them, It is written, My house shall be called the house of prayer, but you have made it a den of thieves. Two, Jesus by his own authority, I say unto you, Issued commandments, Matthew twenty two thirty seven to 40, Jesus said unto them, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy mind. This is the first and greatest commandment, and the second is like unto it. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Number three, and they certainly didn't like this. Jesus forgave sins without requiring a sacrifice. What could you call that? Corporate downsizing. Corporate downsizing. Mark 2, 1 to 11. I want to turn your hymnals, uh, hymnals, your Bibles there, please. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Mark 2, Mark 2, second chap- chapter, 1 to 11. And again he entered into Capernaum after some days, and it was noted or noised that he was in the house. And straightway many were gathered together, insomuch that there was no room to receive them. No, not as so much as about the door. And he preached the word unto them. And they came unto him, bringing one sick of the palsy, which was born of four. And when they could not come nigh unto him for the press, they uncovered the roof where he was. And when they had broken it up, they let down the bed and wherein the sick of the palsy lay. When Jesus saw their faith, he said unto the sick of the palsy, Son, thy sins be forgiven thee. But there were certain of the scribes sitting there and reasoning in their hearts, Why does it, doth this man thus speak blasphemies? Who can forgive sins but God only? Hmm. Who was Jesus? And immediately when Jesus perceived in his spirit that they so reasoned within themselves, he said unto them, Who else can know what another person is thinking, right? Why reason ye these things in your hearts? Whether is it easier to say to the sick of the palsy, Thy sins be forgiven thee, or to say, Arise and take up thy bed and walk? But that ye may know that the Son of Man hath power on earth to forgive sins. He saith to the sick of the palsy, I say unto thee, Arise and take up thy bed, and go thy way unto thine house. And immediately he rose, took up the bed, and went forth before them all, insomuch that they were all amazed, and glorified God, saying, We never saw it on this fashion. Hmm. Was Jesus kicking the hornet's nest? He certainly was. Finally, John 2.19, Jesus had just finished cleansing the temple of the money changers and the merchandisers. The Jews asked Jesus as to what right... Or by whose authority he had to do such things. Jesus answered and said unto them, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. And of course they scoffed at him, telling him that it took over 46 years to build this temple. And in three days, how could he possibly rebuild it in three days? He was talking, of course, by his physical, spiritual temple. Of course, the priests were so embedded in the carnal finiteness 
of their business, they could never have comprehended the spiritual implications. Coming swiftly at this point, there would be a storm of biblical proportions that the priests, because of their prophetic blindness, could never have seen coming. Had they been studying the scriptures, maybe. And if they knew, they ignored the inconvenient truth that was moving them quickly to the close of their probation. We might think that today, the things that are happening on the earth today and all around us could be bringing us, bringing us most closely to the end times. We might think that. We need to study that because I believe that we are standing today on the threshold of the end. It would be during the ninth hour, 3 p.m. in the afternoon, the hour of their holy devotion and prayers. It would be a sunny day for the most part. It would be business as usual. The Roman guards at that time had a mission. They would be taking a few dissidents, social outcasts at that time to meet the cross. It was a normal day in Jewish society. So they thought. Shortly before 3 p.m., the sky darkened and there was a slow rumble. Something perhaps like a freight train approaching in the distance. The earth would sway and shake. A wind arrived swirling up dust clouds and thunder began to erupt All the noisy priests were frightened and ran away from the hill called Golgotha. There in the temple, the showbread table would be knocked over. The lighted candles would go out. The curtain dividing the holy place and the most holy place would be torn in two. You might think, just perhaps, the hand of God appeared And with the very finger with which he wrote the Ten Commandments, God would simply, easily do away with the heavily cumbersome curtain that took so many Jewish artisans to put in place. God would have nothing more to do with this mockery, this den of thieves, and charlatans. God would say, I don't live here anymore. Matthew 27, 51. And behold, the veil of the temple was rent twain from top to bottom, and the earth did quake, and the rocks did rent. Now Jesus would replace the function of the temple with his broken and raised body, In Jesus, God met humanity and through his sacrificial bloodletting delivers us all from sin. Can I hear an amen? Amen. In all the gospel of Matthew, it affirms that Jesus as the Son of God has rightfully replaced the Jewish temple. Jesus is Emmanuel, and through him, God walked with us. And if you don't believe me, read Isaiah the prophet, 714. Therefore, the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and shall call his name Emmanuel. Emmanuel, as we stated before, is God with us. Go back to Matthew, the first chapter, 
and you will see the bloodline leading us to verse 118. If you want to turn to your Bibles, just to confirm what I'm saying, Matthew 1, first chapter, and it goes from 1 to 18. And here, in verse 18, the prophecy of Isaiah 7.14 is fulfilled. Not only Isaiah 7.14, but also Isaiah 53, 1 through 12. This is for your own edification. For your own edification. The prophecy is fulfilled. Now you may ask yourself, who is my Jesus? Who is my Jesus? And if you want further studies, Matthew chapters 26, 27, 28. You will see what he went through. What he went through. Our temptations and our failures, God sees them all. But he grants us understanding. He grants us grace by and through the sacrifice the bloodletting of Jesus Christ himself. E.G. White, Signs of the Times, March 7th, 1895. God's love is stronger than our failures. Jesus places the cross in line with the light coming from heaven. For it is there that it shall catch the eye of man. The cross is in direct line with the shining of the divine countenance, so that by beholding the cross, men may know and see God and Jesus Christ whom he had sent. In beholding God, we behold the one who poured out his soul unto death. In beholding the cross, the view is extended to God, and his hatred of sin is discerned. But while we behold in the cross God's hatred of sin, we also behold his love for sinners, which is stronger than death. To the world, the cross is the incontrovertible argument that God is truth and light and love. Amen. Let us remember always to anoint our prayers with the blood of Jesus Christ. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, in your Son's holy name, Jesus, we ask to humbly approach your throne of grace once again. We recognize that you are a merciful and forgiving God who has sent your Son, Jesus, to take our place on the cross. The divine that was made flesh He gave all for that which we deserve. We give thanks today and pray this was a study in spirit and in truth. I pray, Heavenly Father, this was an added blessing to everyone's Sabbath day, this being your day, Heavenly Creator, that you set aside to commune with us. Amen.